Well, this is a story for those exiles of hope restored. It was uh, over a hundred years that they had lived in Babylon. Some, as we heard from Beth sharing with the children, some had returned to Jerusalem in order to rebuild the temple. But this story of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem is a story about rebuilding lives that had been decimated by the defeat of the enemy, of the enemy over them. And in this rebuilding, they had fresh hope. They were coming home. That's the truth. They were coming home. How many of you remember ever seeing Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz click her ruby slippers? And what does she say? There's no place like home. You sports fans, you remember when LeBron James left Miami, came back to Cleveland? What did he say? I'm coming home. He may not like LeBron James, but he came home. Come on. (laughs) Or you who are older, like me, remember watching those stories of Lassie and crying crying with the episode because she finally did get home. There's something about it where we want the story to resolve well. We want our hearts to come home. Home is where the heart is, so we say. Maybe that's why in Jeremiah 29, God gave the exiles that promise, Jeremiah 29, 11, when he said to them, I know the plans I have for you, not for your destruction, but to give you a future full of hope. Or this verse in Isaiah 58, where it says, that God is going to rebuild the cities that have been destroyed. And they're going to engage in the task of rebuilding the walls. So as they return from exile, really there are three phases to the return from exile. The first is the 50,000 sent by Cyrus, the Persian, to actually rebuild the temple of Jerusalem. Remember, a few weeks ago we talked about how amazing that was that God used an idol-worshipping foreign king to prompt the plan of God to rebuild the temple of God in Jerusalem. 50,000 people come back to rebuild it. Then there's Ezra, the prophet, whose name, by the way, means God help. Here's the interesting thing about Ezra's message to the people. Now, I think all of us can relate to this because all of us have had periods in our life where we've maybe had a spiritual exile, a time where maybe it's our self-perception or maybe it's our attitude or maybe it's spiritual ambivalence toward the things of God or the people of God or the church. Or maybe it's a period of ongoing defeat or maybe it's a difficult relationship or you fill in the blank but there are periods of exile and sometimes we don't know how to break out of it and so we just stay there in exile here was the message of Ezra to the people who were still in Persia still settled into Babylon even though there were masses who were going back to their homeland and to Jerusalem Here's what Ezra said. You don't belong here. You don't belong here. Sometimes that's the message you and I need to hear. We need someone to kick us in the south side, someone who can plant a word to us that reminds us of our identity and reminds us of where we really belong and reminds us of the sweetness of, of walking by faith and fellowship with the living God. So instead of living defeated lives or where we rationalize the perpetuation of a life less than our privilege, the word of God comes to us through a prophet who says, Lavig, you don't belong here. You were created for fellowship with the living God. Rise up and return home. That was Ezra's message. You don't belong here. It's time for you to rise up and go home. Then as we heard 
read for us by Jan, the message that came to Nehemiah was that the exiles, having rebuilt the temple, were not doing very well in Jerusalem. They were under constant attack. Isn't it amazing how anytime we try to do something good, especially something good in the name of our Lord, that there's going to be people that will mock us. We might as well get used to it. There are people who will become hypercritical of what we seek to do. I always have to remind myself, because I am by tendency a people pleaser, that I do not live my life to placate the perception of everybody. Guess what? I can't make everybody happy, so I need to ask whether I'm honoring the Lord God. If I'm honoring the Lord God, then I can live with other people's perception that I'm an idiot, even though they might be right. (laughs) We should not be surprised when we face opposition, when we try to do good for God. So, Nehemiah, by the way, I've always thought maybe he was the shortest man in the Old Testament. Nehemiah. And then I heard... And then I heard about Benjamin the shoe height. <laughs> I'm not going to tell that bad joke. <laughs> when you rebuild walls, why do you need walls? Luther says, why do you need civil law? Why do you need policemen? Why do you need an army? Because we're in an imperfect world and we're all corrupt at heart and we're all sinners and we're all broken. So sometimes you need to build the wall to protect the innocent. And that was the case in Jerusalem. Under constant onslaught, they had to build a wall so that their lives could thrive and be at peace. So they needed to rebuild the wall. But when I face opposition, the first thing I ought to do is say, is there truth in what they're saying. Maybe I am wrong. I tend, maybe you do too, to be quick to defend myself and rationalize that I'm always in the right. That isn't the truth. So the first thing I ought to do if I'm facing opposition is say, are they right? Am I wrong? And in humility, I ought to be able to answer that question truthfully. But don't get discouraged. I find it interesting in the description of the rebuilding of the wall that they were to have a brick in one hand and a sword in the other. That's how they were supposed to build. They expected opposition, and so they were going to build and they were going to battle. They were going to be positive and seek to bless, and they were going to fight, if necessary a brick and a sword. But they had another interesting phenomena, which was in the building of the wall, they were really spread out. And so Nehemiah and Ezra made it so that if someone came under attack, you were supposed to blow a trumpet. And in the blowing of the trumpet, everybody was supposed to rally to the point of attack. Christians typically are very good at doing what I call shooting the wounded. We tend to be judgmental. So if my brother or sister falls, I begin to go tisk, tisk, tisk. My finger wags and I write them off and I judge them. The story says. If somebody's under attack, if somebody's struggling, we're supposed to rally. We're supposed to come together. You know, I watched uh, quite a bit of basketball yesterday. I saw you and I lose. I saw the Cyclones lose. And I saw the the Hawkeyes miraculously, there is a God, win in overtime. (laughs) But when you watch big-time basketball and in the battle of that game, where one falls down or gets pushed down or whatever. What do their teammates do when the other falls? Do they turn their backs and kind of walk away? 
No, they run to pick up their buddy, right? Let's blow the trumpet, people of faith. If somebody's struggling, let's rally to support them. Let's pray for them. Let's encourage them. Let's not judge them or dismiss them or blow them off. So they finished the building of the wall. And as we heard so well, a circle within the circle, as Beth had the children do their little circles, they had this big celebration. And it had been over 100 years before an assembly of God's people had heard the word of God read to them. It says that Ezra read for many hours, I forget how many, was it three, four, six? You guys think church of faith is long sometimes. (laughs) But what was fascinating as Ezra read the book of Moses, which by the way, when we use the term law, we think of it as laying down the law. It's a negative connotation. But really for the Hebrews, it meant the Torah, the wisdom of God. The best way, the blessed way to live. And as the people were assembled and heard the word of God read to them, they began to weep. Now why do you think they wept? I think it's because they knew in their hearts, that there was such a disparity from the way that they actually had lived and were still living compared to what God had said, here's the way, my people who belong to me, that they realized that they had lived in defiance of the one who had given them life. And so they began to weep. You ever feel like that? You ever feel confronted or convicted by the Holy Spirit, and you know God is speaking to you. You know that things are out of line in your life. And inside yourself, you maybe begin to make up all these reasons why you were justified, or it's okay to do what you were doing, but the truth is, inside your heart of hearts, you know that you're wrong before God. So they wept. But Ezra and Nehemiah said, don't weep. This is a holy day to the Lord. This is a day of celebration. We're going to have a party. We're going to have a feast. So the whole of the day was God's message to say, you are belonging to me. I have not abandoned you. I'm right here among you. And then they said this, don't weep because In your faith, knowing that truth, you will remember that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Have you ever been so full of joy, so full of happiness, that you wanted to do a happy dance? I'm Norwegian, so that's the best I can do. But have you ever felt like, yes! God, life is good, right? Have you ever felt like that? And have you ever felt like that because you knew you were loved by the one who gave you life? Have you ever felt like that because you knew that all your sins are forgiven? Not just some of them, all your sins are forgiven. Have you ever lived with joy because you know that the spirit of the living God has decided to dwell within your heart? The joy of the Lord becomes a source of strength. You don't belong here. Go home. And be full of the joy and the courage and the strength that it takes to live as the people of God. Isn't that awesome? That's what they were experiencing. They were reoriented to their identity. God had not abandoned them or given up on them. They were his people. But here's my last point to you, which is, As they were rebuilding walls, we know that God is in the business of rebuilding lives. So I want to encourage you in whatever your journey today, that God is in the business of making you promises. You belong to him. You are forgiven. His spirit lives within you. And we're going to say today, 
Lord, I'm going to take you at your word. I love the scripture in 2 Corinthians 1.20 where it says, Every promise of God is yes in Jesus Christ. Every promise God has made to me and to you is yes in Jesus Christ. I'm going to take him at his word. I had a pastoral colleague who told this story years ago in another parish. He went to work one day. He was at the church office and the police of this little town he lived in called him up. Said, do you know where your son is? Well, he's at school. The policeman said, no, he's not. It turns out that his son and his girlfriend had stolen the family car, taken the family car, and his son had lifted, without the father's knowledge, one of his credit cards out of his wallet, and his son had taken off on a journey. And they didn't know where he was. They put all, all points all points bulletin looking for his son. For three days, they couldn't find him. They didn't know where he was until finally, three days later, the police in Kansas City said, Pastor, we have your son and his friend. Do you want us to ship him home to you? Or are you going to come? He said, I'll come. Now, this pastor was about six foot eight. I'm not exaggerating. Six foot eight. And his son was equal stature. So the son, though, is kind of shriveled in his posture, sitting in the police station. But the father walks into the police station. Tears are rolling down his cheeks. His son gets up and moves toward his father and begins to try and apologize for how stupid he was. And the father throws his arms around his son. He says, I love you. I'm so glad you're safe. I'm so glad you're mine. I love you. The son says it again. He says, I screwed up, Dad. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know if you could ever take me back. And the father repeats it, giving him an even stronger hug to his chest. I love you, son. Let's go home. Do you know that the heart of your Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, is just like that? And you and I can say, God, I take you at your word. I take you at your word that you forgive me, that you will not reject me, that I belong to you. I take you at your word. And then as they settled in Jerusalem, they began to align their lives with the wisdom of God's word. The Hebrew word is tzaddik. Just to prove to me you're still listening, can you say tzaddik? Tzaddik. Better. Come on. That's better. Do you know you who lived in the 60s when the Righteous Brothers played their music, do you know what the righteous term was? Sadiq. You know those old beatniks that played their songs? Hey, righteous. <laughs> Sadiq. It's all in harmony. Do you know that in the, the Hebrew language or Aramaic yet today, if a mechanic is working on your engine and it's out of timing or it's misfiring and he fixes it, so that it's in timing again and it's firing just like it should, he'll say it's sadiq. It's in alignment. It's in harmony the way it should be. So we, in our foolishness, live the way we please. We disregard the wisdom of the word and we wonder why our life begins to misfire or not run the way it should. And then sometimes... It, we disobey, our life begins to unravel, and we say, God, how could you do that to me? Bizarre, isn't it? But the response of the people from their weeping and their truth that God had not rejected them, that, that in fact they came together as his people to celebrate, was this. 
we praise you, God, that we are your people and we will align our lives with your word. Randy Frazee, who crafted the narrative of the story, along with Max Lucado, tells a story about a man in his church named Mark. He was 47 years old, and his grandfather had died of alcoholism. His father had died of alcoholism. And as he grew up in that, that home that struggled to know what love was like, he also entered into that same rhythm of overindulging in the alcohol and living, using drugs. And actually, the truth was, as Frazee told the story, he was addicted to almost everything that would attempt to fill the emptiness of his life. And at 47, he walks into the church where Frandy Frazee is the pastor, and he says to the pastor, I've tried everything in my life. Nothing has worked. I might as well try God. And in the healing grace of Jesus Christ, Mark's life began to be restored. And he, in faith, began to learn the truth of walking with God. He began to align his life with the word of God. And God rebuilt Mark's life. Mark continued to be actively involved in the recovery programs of AA and other ways to give back. And there was a man named Pete in his group in AA. One day, Mark, months after he accepted Jesus Christ's grace into his life, saw Pete walking on the street homeless. And Mark who now has decided in his heart he's going to align his life with the wisdom of the word, pulls over and invites Pete to come to his house. He takes him in and he gives him new clothes and he feeds him. And for weeks, Pete lives at his house until Mark helps make arrangements for him to return home to his family in California. Would that faith would so grasp our vision of mission that we believe that God, by His Spirit, forgives us, that we belong to Him, but that we would so align our lives with the Word of God that our compassion resonates with everyone who still needs the love of God to rebuild their lives. That's our privilege. That's our calling. That's why we praise God. Because we're his people and God is in the business of rebuilding lives. Amen.